Welcome to this afternoon's briefing on the future of cities. Uh, today's speakers include Saskia Sassen, professor of psychology at Columbia University. Sociology. Sociology. My apologies. Sociology at Columbia University. William Baker, a structural engineering partner at Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. A Anthony Wood, executive director of the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. And Virginia Parks, associate professor at the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago. So I'm just going to start talking briefly. All right, so the future of cities, uh, let me just give you a framing, a framing thought. I think that on the one hand, we have technologies, capabilities, discoveries, money piles, piles of money literally, to enact, if you want, to develop perfect cities. But of course, there is no such thing as a perfect city. On the other hand, we have masses of people who are being literally expelled very often from the land because the land is being bought up by foreign firms, by foreign governments, who of course have to go to the city. So besides the natural growth of the population in cities, <clears throat> we have people who are expelled from rural areas. Now, a lot of these people, the first stop is a shanty town. If they are lucky, it's a working shanty, a, a, a slum, you know the, the, the language right, that I'm using. So in, if I look at the future, I see two urban settings. And they will be, those two urban settings can happen in New York, in Shanghai, in Nairobi, in many places. And one of them is really advanced urban spaces with extraordinary technologies and capabilities. But the other one is a degraded space. Now, some of those people may be very creative, generate little businesses, have startups, because we see that in the slums. But it is a life of hardship, where getting water will be tough, getting electricity will be tough, etc., etc. Thanks. Um, so the challenge is, can we create more of a balance, not put so many resources in building the ultimate luxury urban settings and redistribute a bit so that we really have uh, a reasonable mode of urban living. Sure, there will always be inequality, always elite spaces, but that most of the people have access to water, have access to food, etc., and that cities can in fact endogenize, generate part of their own food, part of their own energy, et cetera, et cetera. And I've been very interested in understanding how the capabilities of the biosphere in the form of bacteria, algae, capturing you know, the energy that movement produces, a whole range of things. How can we deploy those inside cities? Okay. Um, my name is Bill Baker with SOM. And uh, what I, what I uh, was brought to the uh, program we had earlier uh, was the issue of, of density and, um, and, shall I say, a case for density. Uh, you know, we all know the population is greatly increasing. You know, that, you know, that's a given, and it's, and it's, it's going to continue to, to do so. But so the question is, where, where should they go? Should they be uh, dispersed? Uh, uh, dispersion of people through, through the countryside, or should it be concentrated? Should it be done in a, in a dense manner? So, uh, and certainly the, uh, the U.S. has taken the kind of the sprawl uh, scenario uh, forward. Uh, I mean, currently uh, we're, uh, we're absorbing in development uh, the agricultural land. Uh, every five years we're absorbing the equivalent of New Jersey into uh, development. You know, from, from agricultural use uh, in, in, into um, development. So uh, that's kind of the, the, the model that we have. A city such as Chicago is actually less dense than it was in 1950. You know, the population's grown, but the boundaries have grown further if you take a look at the, at the metropolitan uh, area. The, uh, and so, you know, how dense uh, should we do, or, or, or why not do disperse? Is it, what's, what's the problem? And the problem that, that, that we see is, is and I, there's many, many ways to look at it. I chose to look at it in a very limited manner as far as, uh, 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 let's say, energy or carbon issues, okay? The, um, you know, the per capita consumption of, of, uh, of, of carbon is, is, is less in cities. And that tends to be true. Some countries are more efficient than others, but, but, but within a country, the, the city tends to be 
uh, more efficient in the sense uh, than, than the country as a whole. And so, so, uh, so th there is there is this this uh, uh, evidence that, that perhaps a more dense uh, development is the way to go. And then, if you if you look at a transit-based uh, development, which is very very important, and uh, I used an example of a if you took a major development in the center of Chicago. You'll have very few parking spots because the city will not allow you to have very many parking spots. You're limited. Uh, you'll be uh, able to access your building by uh, by mass transit, okay? Versus the the suburbs. Uh, if you have an office in the suburb, your parking spot has more space than you do. Your car has more space, okay? Uh, you know, uh, the uh, average, uh, depending on if it's uh, structured parking or just surface parking, there's about uh, a little over 300 square feet per car required. Of, uh, of, of construction. My office is nowhere near that big, okay? Now, if you, if you take the, the space I use and divide it, uh, you know, and added the mechanical space and the like, I may have two-thirds as much area as, as my car does if, I, if, if I'm in the suburbs. So this is, you know, this is part of the thing that one has to think about is that, uh, is, is the loss of land and the, uh, and the, uh, and the uh, energy and carbon footprint that's generated by, by the person who's in the city versus the, that you know, in the suburb. Part of it is related to area. Quite frankly, the people in the urban settings have less, at least in the living point of view, have less square footage per person than they do you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a less dense situation. And that's part of the, part of the, the calculus is the fact that uh, uh, not that the city construction is necessarily more, cons uh, more efficient per square foot, but there's just fewer square feet per, per person. Uh, to, for housing in the city, uh, and and then um, uh, the, uh, the you know the issues of um, of uh, you know and if you did take the the entire world okay and say we are going to go urban, how much room do we need? You could fit uh, at the density of, of of Manhattan, the entire world could fit into Colorado, okay. Uh, at the density of, of the inner boroughs of London, the whole you'd have to add uh, you'd have to add New Mexico and Kansas to the uh, to it, but the, the entire uh, population of the world could fit into that area. So, you know, there's something to be said for should, should we try to go for more density um, as as a way to uh, that the world can absorb a lot more population. Thank you. So I, I, I think one of the most amazing statistics in the context of, of what we've been discussing today comes from the United Nations, which show that 180,000 people are urbanizing on this planet every day. That means more than a million people every week are either being born into cities or moving from a rural to an urban existence. 53% of the planet is now urbanized. So, you know, that helps to put in perspective how do we as a global species cope with this urban expansion if we need to build a new or expanded city of one million people every week? Um, I think a large part of the world believe that density is the answer. And the reason for that, as Bill has explained, it's about concentration of people, concentration of infrastructure, better land use, either the vertical model rather than the horizontal model largely because of the infrastructure. Um, but I believe that cities are pretty poorly equipped to deal with this issue of increasing density. And especially in the context of, of, of cities in, in China and India, Indonesia, Brazil, not necessarily established cities in the West that are, that are seeing this, this rate of increase from, say, one to 10 million in 10 years. You know, it's, it's, it, that's the kind of rate of what's happening here. And, and, and in my field, the tall building, I, I believe that the tall building can be a part of the answer. Actually, it needs to be a part of the answer. But I think it's 5% along a huge path that it needs to tread until it actually is contributing to sustainability in the way that it could do. I think it needs to um, get far more diversity of program. I think it needs to start to bring greenery into the, into the material palette. Um, and, and one of the most crucial things, which I'll leave you with, is we need to bring the horizontal back into the vertical city. If you think of a city area where, at the moment, a million people live in that area, um, those people rely on that ground floor as their support mechanism. Schools, shops, doctor's surgery, parks, sidewalks, circulation. And if we're going to take that city 
and it's going to get 10 times more vertical, 10 times denser, because we're not going horizontal anymore, then we need to replicate aspects of that ground floor support mechanism in the sky through connecting the buildings and creating urban habitat in the sky. And if you think that sounds like science fiction, it does, and it is, because there's almost not been a science fiction film, A City of the Future, proposed that doesn't show multi-levels, because it makes absolute sense. And the good news is I can show you perhaps 100 projects around the world that are already doing this. So science fiction is here. Density is good is a question that we're grappling with, and what I wanted to ask is density for whom? So I'm an urban geographer, and one way to think about the relationship between the built environment and social equity is looking at access to opportunities. So one thing that I look at is access to jobs. A quick snapshot of the geographic location of jobs and housing and the connection between them is the commute. And so when we look at commutes, uh, for Chicago, the most recently available data, we see large racial disparities between African Americans and whites. About 40 minutes per week, African Americans travel longer to get to work. That's exasperated when you look at low-wage workers. So when you just compare low-wage workers to other low-wage workers, it's most, uh, uh, it's sharpest for actually women. So African American women in Chicago travel to low-wage jobs 80 minutes more per week than their female counterparts. So that raises huge questions about what the city means for economic mobility, what it means for immediate employment prospects, but also what that means for interge intergenerational mobility, which we've seen research that shows that cities that are less segregated and geographically less segregated are better for poor kids and their probabilities of moving up the economic ladder. So how do we, though, think about accessibility? So we get commute, that's just one snapshot in time from one person to one job opportunity. We want to think about the location of jobs or housing relative to a set of opportunities of jobs. So we use something called an accessibility index, which allows us to then build in friction of distance. So we can weight closer jobs uh, more than, for, than jobs that are further away. That gives us a sense then of what accessibility looks like over different density profiles. So to, get an, uh, so to think about you have a good accessibility index, that same measure could be generated from a city that has lots of opportunities at a core and people living uh, outside of that core. Or you could think about it being a polycentric urban uh, geography. It's a different density profile, but it gives you the same accessibility uh, index. What's critical, though, is the transportation network that connects these, connects residences to the opportunities. So you could think of a very dense neighborhood, right, that's completely disconnected from a dense area of opportunities. So if we want to think about density for all and density that benefits the greatest number of urban residents, we really have to think about that connection, which is an efficient and equitable transportation system married to also fair housing policies, particularly given the history of racial inequality in the housing market in the United States. Thank you. Okay, we're going to open it up for questions, but before we do, I'm sure you're all aware by now that the researchers will be in the follow-up room across the hall for questions if we run out of time. And I would also like to remind you that this event is being webcast, so please uh, wait for the mic and preface your question with uh, your name and affiliation. Thanks. Questions? Yes. <clears throat> William Grassi, MetaNexus. Um, uh, <coughs> Mr. Baker, the, um, the, the statistics about carbon footprint in urban areas uh, urban dwellers still need food and water and all that stuff needs to be transported to them. And I'm just curious, uh, actually, how one derives those statistics. No, no, and I was just speaking about the, uh, the area occupied by the, uh, by the, by the, by the where they work and, and live, not, not the area that needs to support it. Currently, almost the entire globe is used to support the population we currently have, and it, it is dispersed and everywhere. And so, no, that's, uh, and, and so that, that is, 
uh, certainly, uh, you know, part of the equation is how do you produce the the uh, the, uh, the food and the resources. Uh, you have to, the whole world is necessarily for that to to support. If you even if you had the whole world in, in Colorado, uh, which someone questioned whether or not that's the right state to go to or not. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, you know you you still would need the rest of the world to, to support them. Uh, but what is interesting, though, uh, in the U.S., where we where we do our 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 model is to expand and, and oftentimes take uh, take the land that can supply that support out of out of the ability to provide that support. When you when you take a, a, a basically, I think it's a million acres per year out of agricultural use. By uh, you know, so one question is that perhaps there's another model that could preserve that land to support the, the ever increasing population. But I think, if I may. Um, I think that cities must find inside of their own complex structures ways of producing inside the city what is now being brought in from all over the world. They will never be completely self-sufficient. But really, when you bring in signs and the kinds of knowledges that we're discovering, every time we move inside our house, we generate energy. We need to capture that energy. If we are on a bike, we certainly generate more. Uh, I have been very interested in seeing how bacteria and algae placed in particular settings of the city generate stuff that we need. A bacterium that if you put it in brown waters, organic brown waters, what we produce in quantity in kitchens and bathrooms, this bacteria produces a molecule of a plastic, a plastic that is durable, resistant, but biodegradable. So in other words, the city can either export that then or whatever, but the city must produce endogenously much more than it produces now. That to me seems really a first stop. Questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, Manuel Lino from El Economista in Mexico. Uh, would you care to share uh, your thoughts about uh, cities like Mexico City or, or Beijing or, or the cities that actually don't have a urban planning? Uh, what will happen with the cities? What do you think will happen with the cities? Well, I, I'll have a stab at that. I, actually, I think some of the best cities in the world are those that weren't, weren't urbanly planned. You know, that where actually over a number of decades and possibly centuries, there was a, a sense of urban grain that could be built up, which wasn't necessarily, you know, dictated by, by one huge plan. And I think wherever humanity has kind of, kind of planned a whole city has often resulted in a dissatisfaction, you know, and it's taken, you know, I'm talking about the Canberras of the world or you know, Brasilias, where, where actually it's taken maybe 50 or 60 years of, of humanizing of those cities for them to, to kind of become livable. So, so I think we do need to plan the cities, but we also need to plan for, you know, for, 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 plan for not planning, you know what I mean? We, I don't think we can dictate what's going to happen, mm -hmm. even in five, ten years from now, that we can say confidently that we can you know, just plan the whole, the whole city. And I think a lot of the things that are happening in, in Asia and in the Middle East, um, you know, in terms of the new cities being planned, uh, that it, you know, it's, I'm not sure that there's enough flexibility being brought, brought into those cities because every year we discover something new. You know, we were talking over lunch about we solve one problem for sustainability and, it, it, you know, without even realizing it, create another four or five. I have no experience myself of Mexico City, but I spent a lot of time in, in Asia, I spent a lot of time in, in Chinese cities in Beijing. And um, what concerns me about those cities is that they are developing along plans and taking out the urban grain and taking out the things that have made the, spe the city pretty special for, you know, some, in some cases, hundreds of years. But Mexico City actually has extraordinarily interesting initiatives. I cannot see you from the Economista. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But hi, I mean, in Mexico, there is, I, I think that there is an amazing amount of mobilizing. You know, we say that about New York City, I think we say that about Chicago too. Mexico City is one of them. And Beijing, you don't see as much. You have very fancy urbanists, fancy urbanists, thinking up, you know, this is Beijing. But in Mexico City, you know, you have an energy at ground level. And in the barriadas, and I grew up in Buenos Aires. 
you also have a lot of energy in Buenos Aires. <laughs> and that matters. I think cities are partly constituted by, you know, by the humph of people, by the spirit, by how they like to make music, how they like to make their housing. So cities and our critical, uh, people are critical parts of cities. So Mexico City, I find, I mean, you have problems, mind you, huh? extreme inequality, etc. I'm not trying to, but there is beyond it all, groups, I know quite a few architects who have devoted themselves to, to working with, you know, with uh, poorer neighborhoods and really impressive stuff. Hi there, Todd with NCA Magazine. I'm just curious if there are perhaps one or two cities you might mention right now in the world who you think are getting it right and that we could learn from and what they're doing right that, that could be replicated perhaps. I'm happy to tackle that first. I, you know, I think Singapore is head and shoulders above anywhere else in the world. But, you know, Singapore are doing things that, that, that here in America have been doing things. You know, we're, we're still talking about as science fiction. Yeah? Yet at the same time, Singapore gets a bad rap because the government bans chewing gum. Yeah? So I'm not saying they got it 100% right, but, but the, the, some of the urbanist, urban planning things and some of the physical infrastructure that they've put in place in Singapore, I think is incredible. I mean, you know, you put the words government built high rise housing together in virtually any country of the West and it just spells disaster. And in Singapore, 80% of people live in government-built high-rise housing. And most of the other 20% live in private-built high-rise housing. And they've managed to make this, 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 this transition to living in government-built high-rise housing that most of the West has never been able to do over the course of 70, 60, 70 years. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So if you're looking, if I'm looking for, 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 for the closest we've got to a utopia in urbanistic terms, not necessarily political and other, I'd look to Singapore. But Medellin, which is not as, doesn't have the resources, a city that came out of a history of extraordinary violence and used culture, good architecture, good urbanism to civilize it. An extraordinary mayor called Sergio Fajardo was sort of a hero to many urbanists. And for instance, what he did, <clears throat> he brought great architecture in the form of libraries and schools up in the slums. You know, bringing it, right, and, and sort of, that is an extraordinary city with far fewer resources than Singapore and a patchier process. But really public transport, public spaces, public culture, public education, and sort of to try to create a generic base for everybody in the city. So to me, Medellin is really, Singapore, I agree with you, number one, sort of. But Medellin is a more real example, what you could do uh, with far fewer resources. I see somebody smiling. Is that because of Medellin or? <laughs> it's perhaps, I mean, it's a, um, the obvious answer in many ways, but thinking purely just on transportation and thinking about poly, polycentricity both within a city and across cities, right? So within a country, the Netherlands is a model. I mean, we talk about it a lot, but it's about thinking about the multimodal system that's also public and private. So you can go to a train station and rent a bike from a private vendor, right? And then go out, come back, get on a train. You're working at Delft University. You return to Eindhoven. And, uh, and there's your own bike that's been parked in the public uh, bike parking spot. Um, but they've also got trams, water taxis. I mean, it's an incredibly flexible, um, multimodal, and interconnected uh, transportation system that's both within and between cities. Any questions? So I'm thinking maybe some folks are wondering, uh, maybe this ties into what you were just talking about, but. Could you maybe talk about some of the strategies for reducing the commute disparity that you mentioned earlier, especially mm -hmm. among low-income uh, women and mm -hmm. men? I mean, part of the story in Chicago, clearly, but it's a, st it's a story that's shared across most uh, U.S. metropolitan regions, is a history of racial residential segregation. So it's something that happens at a particular point in time. We now say racial discrimination in the housing market is illegal. It still happens. 
But now people have built their lives in these neighborhoods, right? And so we continue to have um, the effects of this past experience of racial residential segregation. So a few things we can think about. I mean, I think the easiest is a more robust transportation system. Like that's the first, you don't have to move people, you don't necessarily have to move jobs. We think a lot about trying to move jobs into neighborhoods. I find that to be problematic. Um, development, which we usually mean at the neighborhood level, usually follows productive development. So let's get people to those jobs through a very efficient and cheap mechanism and then eliminate um, these, the paralysis in the housing market that's either about racial discrimination or it's about foreclosures or things like this. We have to um, sort of loosen that up if people want to move. But if they don't want to move, I think we really have to think about the robust transportation system um, in place. We were just talking about the, the, the L system. The L system extends to the suburbs, right? And I think we would argue that's a good thing. It connects the region. The red line does not extend to the furthest southern boundary of the city of Chicago. So those are African-American neighborhoods that have absolutely no L line available to them. What is L? Yes, in that white sweater? Lisa Raffensperger, Discover Magazine. I'm wondering um, if we talk specifically, maybe it'll apply to tall buildings and what the um, what the technical limitations are there. But then maybe from there, I'm curious to hear some other thoughts on on what specifically we're lacking technologically to 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 make these goals that we're talking about happen in in today's cities. Oh, well, uh, so your question is about how big can we go, or are we? Yeah, is it, is it um, are there attitudes that are are resistant to this idea of kind of verticality? Are the, is it is it a technological challenge? Is it a, um, a materials challenge? Uh, you know, certainly uh, from the um, obviously we've proven that we can go very vertical and very much. Uh, we are learning how to do it more efficiently. Uh, you know, the energy consumption of buildings today is much less than it was in the past. Uh, we're learning how to retrofit existing buildings so they, they do much less, they absorb much less energy than they did, did in the past. So in, in that sense, we're, we're getting be, uh, better. But there is a lot of cultural issues about tall, which, which is very local. You know, it's not even national, it's local. Uh, I remember one time we were um, uh, looking to do a very tall building here in, uh, in Chicago. And we went to the city council, and there was one person from the public who came to speak, and they were in favor of the building, okay? And as opposed to many, like, in, you know, in, in um, New York, there's a lot of, you know, resistance often for, for the new development. Um, and so, in, you know, London is, is learning to grapple with the, the shard at 300 meters. Uh, they now love it. Yeah, they, they have yeah. decided that it's okay. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there, there's there's the, 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 this cultural cultural shift, and and certainly um, a lot of people who are not familiar with tall buildings, um, it's 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 the uh, it's it's uh, have a, has a very bad connotation to it, and you know and, and I think a lot of it has to do with just just exposure to it, uh, you know the you know, oh you wouldn't want to live in that tall building would you, and. Uh, <laughs> And, and and so um, it's a lot of it. A lot of it is cultural, but the technology is is coming a lot. One of the things about the tall building, uh, particularly if it's tied to um, transit, okay, that 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 people can get to it and get away from it. Uh, the, one of the worst things you can do is a tall building without mass transit, because you know the, you know you clog the you clog the roads trying to get in and to get out when you have so many people. Mm. Which, uh, you have to go to it. So it is very. Uh, um, but it, it, I think it is the, the way of the future. Having said that, I want to—you can have density without tall, okay? Um, and, um, and and some cities do that better. You know, London itself does not have that much tall. You know, but it is very dense. But it is, it is very dense. Although so people do have a long commutes too. If you're if you're if you're not wealthy, you're you're in, on the train for an hour or so, mm -hmm. at least, uh, to, just to get into the city. So. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll just add a couple of things. That I, 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 
there are no technological barriers on tall buildings, as far as I'm concerned. The, the, only, the limit on, the, on, on, on great height, if that is your motivation, is purely financial. You know, we now have a kilometer high tower uh, on site in, in, the, in the deserts of Saudi Arabia, and I believe we could easily go to two, three, four kilometers. I think really the technology, it, the technologies exist. It, it, the height is a product of the base, really. And, 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 and you know, I mean, actually, Bill, Bill talks about, you know, one of the main uh, limiting factors is, is perhaps, you know, the, the way that your, the, your inner ear pressurizes as you, you know, as you rise up so swiftly in an elevator. But even that, again, if your motivation is the tallest building in the world, you know, La Paz, Bolivia is the highest capital city in the world. And yes, if you fly in there, you'll probably get altitude sickness. But if you really want to go there, you will find a way to go there and stage off and work your way up through the Andes. So, so the, 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 the limits on tall buildings in terms of pure height, I believe, are, are, are purely financial. Now, as to their appro appropriateness in the city and some of the things that I believe and I mentioned in terms of connection and greenery and all this stuff, the limit there, again, is not technological. It is, it's political. It's partly economic, but it's mostly political. And, you know, at the moment, most cities of the world, the buildings are kind of the responsibility of the developer, and we set a framework for it. But the infrastructure, i.e. the roads and the sewage and the power and the parks and the sidewalks, are the responsibility of the government, whether that's a city government, federal government, whatever. And, and what I'm advocating in terms of the, 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 the cities of the future is that the buildings need to have the infrastructure, the parks, the circulation horizon, all that stuff. And it will only happen when we see a new political um, way of thinking about our cities where buildings become a public-private interface, not just in one domain or the other. So it's not technological, as far as I can see. But the other thing that you brought up this morning, mixity of uses inside the tall building. Partly the transit function moves inside the building. All those, those are very important elements. So it's not just a monstrous accumulation of all the same, but you know, a really a sort of an urban world inside of there. I personally wish we would not go four kilometers. <laughs> I find that is, I don't know what, but too much. Any more questions? Yes. So much of the urban landscape has been, and the suburban landscape, has been built for automobiles. And, um, you know, I live in, in Manhattan and um, just think what it would, how wonderful it would be if there weren't any cars there. And I just wonder what, 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 uh, what, what are some, I mean, obviously multimodal transportation is a great thing. City bike has dramatically changed my life um, for the positive. Um, um, can, can you see a different uh, a, a city that's not built for automobiles or that's highly restricted? And what, what examples would you give? I mean, Netherlands, you already spoke of. But I think we're I, beginning I, to tip. The younger people are far less interested in the car as experience. The car maybe still as an instrument. But the car, you know, think of suburban America. The car is a world. It's a cultural artifact. It's not. And that, I think, is one of the big changes. But the other thing is what we should be using, you said that earlier, the bus. The bus is cheap, flexible, and if you think about the Millennium bus, you know where you have a dedicated lane for buses as if it were a subway. So we have multiple ways in moving a lot of people. The bike, you know, at one extreme, but buses which are much cheaper than an underground or a train. So I think that the car, in certain cities, like in Manhattan, a lot of people who live in Manhattan don't even want to own a car. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it also doesn't make sense. You have parking issues, you have, you know. So, so I think we might just be tipping over in some, in some parts of the world huh, into other modes of transport. We need transport. But the Asian cities, they are just still, I think, on the exploding end of more and more cars. San Paulo would be another example of a disastrous mm -hmm. transportation system. I mean, but people are beginning to understand that it is disastrous. Three hours, <laughs> three hours sitting in a traffic jam. Mm -hmm. But we have empirical case studies. We know the story, right? It's a story 
of price. I mean, when you said it's too expensive, uh, we've made the car cheap in the United States. We built free highways. Uh, we subsidized, well, debatable now. I mean, we have recently but production sometimes when subsidized, but it's more important that we look at the roads are free, gas is cheap, as much as we might complain about the price, the purchase price of a car is cheap, and most importantly, parking is very cheap. And in other countries where rates of automobile usage are lower, all of those prices are double, triple, quadruple what they are in the United States. We have a long history, we have decades of subsidizing automobile, automo, automo, automobile use, I guess I'll just say. And part of that's political. So um, we know that we can drive down rates of automobile use, but we know the way that we do it is we price, and people don't want that. Um, and even in European countries where you know, you buy, the, the joke is right, you, you buy a car three times to pay the taxes. Um, you see, as those countries have gotten wealthier, increasing rates of automobile usage. So we have the answer. It's that we have to price what the real cost of driving a car is. But whether we have the political will to do that or not is another question. Uh, actually, I would add to that. I agree with that. We need to price it appropriately. You know, I, I've lived here in Chicago for eight years, and I'm still staggered how cheap anything to do with the automobile is. You know how much it costs to sit your driving test in the UK? Three, four hundred dollars just to sit it. And the, the number of people that pass it at the first go is, you know, a small percentage. If the infrastructure around the automobile as a concept in America is massively, massively subsidized. It, it's tiny in comparison to most places. So I agree with that. But the other side of it is you need to give people a, not, a viable alternative. And outside Manhattan and Chicago and maybe one or two other places, there's no viable alternative. You know, we mentioned the Shard in London. The Shard is the tallest building in Western Europe. It's a, sky, it's a super tall, you know. It's just over 300 meters or, you know, what's that, 1,000 feet. It's a big deal. And there are only 77 super tall buildings in the world. How many car parking spaces does that building have? I think it's in the region of 14, one four, yeah? And this is a mixed office, hotel, residential building. Could you imagine the Sears Tower with 14 car parking spaces? <laughs> Why? Because it's based over one of the biggest transport interchanges in the whole of Europe, actually, not only London. That ain't an accident. That wasn't an accident. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, it was part of the planning of it, is you've got to start to position these nodes of, of, of office and residential over transport, transport interchanges and give people a viable alternative. Mary Miller at the Exploratorium. I'm wondering what, um, as cities get denser, what um, the impact is as far as delivering electricity and power to them. Because you can't obviously do much on, on the way of solar power, and you have to have very large power plants sort of nearby to make that efficient. So, so what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, when I stand back and I look at how we have managed over the last 100 years for cities that are fairly large to bring in all the things that they need, I think it's a little miracle, frankly. And I think we are reaching tipping points for a whole variety of reasons, partly very elderly infrastructure that is beginning to decay, you know, partly more and more demand, so there are breakdowns of systems. So we are beginning to experience the limits of what has worked rather well, certainly in Europe and in many parts of Latin America and in North America. You know, Asia is a totally different evolution, if you want. So I think it becomes absolutely critical that we begin, and some of these technologies already exist, the challenge is how do we bring them in and apply them, that we begin to capture, for instance, on the energy. We produce enormous amounts of energy within a city. Anything that moves is generating energy. We need to capture them. We need to transform everything that the city produces that is now a negative and a burden, like all the brown waters. We don't know how to dispose of all of that stuff. It's got to be working. And the technology and the science exist. What we don't know is how to bring it together. So I think if we don't, and that will still not solve the full problem. But right now, we are discovering, like in, I live in Manhattan. Oh, are we, are we discovering the limits? I would say London, too, with the, with the floods, et cetera, right? 
So we are discovering that, you know what? This which has worked so nicely is no longer working. Now, we have totally new infrastructures being built in Asia, especially you know, Singapore, but also in China, etc. Who knows what the trajectories will be there? And who knows how good the quality is of some of that? But the most urgent thing is we need the scientists, the biologists, the, all of these, the technologists and the engineers. We need simply new forms of knowledge that are assemblages, if you want, of bits and pieces of these different bodies of specialized knowledge. And a lot of that knowledge exists. The real challenge is how do we make it work? How do we urbanize it? You know, that's sort of the language that I like to use. Questions? Questions? I think we're just about out of time, um, but we'll be in the follow-up room if you want to do some one-on-one -on -one interviews. And thanks for coming.